Good afternoon, everyone. Hey. I'm going to start this, this session now, best practices for advanced lightning apps. My name is John. I'm the director for IC Technical Enablement and App Exchange in EMEA North, covering Benelux, UK and Ireland, and the Nordics. So my team works with App Exchange partners in those regions and helps them from a technical standpoint to, uh, to make the best out, out of the Salesforce platform. Together with, uh, with my colleague Rodrigo over there, I also lead Lightning from an App Exchange standpoint globally. So this session that we will have today, and let me just quickly go through the forward-looking statement. So I'm going to say a few things today. Please make any decisions based on, uh, on what's available today. So this session is actually based on a webinar that I did last year, around six months ago, around, uh, again, best practices for advanced Lightning apps. This particular webinar is available. It's actually longer. It has a very interesting Q&A at the end where I, I cover a whole bunch of interesting questions around uh, performance specifically and architectural questions around building Lightning apps. So please do take, take your time to go there. And, uh, and we have a lot of more material interesting for you guys there in the, in the developer blog at, uh, at salesforce.com. So this is what I'll be covering today. I'll first start by introducing this concept of what an advanced Lightning app actually is. And then I'll start discussing what you actually need to, to potentially architect and build such an app. I will go over the Lightning feature set that we have. I will go over some ideas around how you can architect your components to support creating such an app. And finally, I'll cover some aspects around ensuring that you have performance top of mind when you're building an app using Lightning. So let's start by defining what an advanced Lightning app actually is. Well, such an app has been built from the ground up for Lightning experience. It probably doesn't even support Classic. Light Lightning has so many features that are actually quite different from what Classic provides that in, the, in this particular case, this app will only be supporting Lightning. This also means that such an app will have potentially tens to hundreds of custom Lightning components that are there because the app needs to support very, very specific use cases. And the standard components that Salesforce provides may not be enough for that particular scenario. But still, those components are, are highly customizable using you know, something that, like the Lightning App Builder, you can leverage the utility bar to make some components available in every single page of a particular app. And finally, these apps will have a significant metadata layer that allows you to customize components in a very fine-grained way and allowing admins to use components on a number of different objects without actually having to rewrite or, or use different types of components. So examples of such apps would be something like a very heavy customization of a sales cloud environment, or app exchange apps, for instance, covering HR or accounting, so horizontal scenarios, or vertical or industry apps covering something like real estate, insurance, retail, public sector, and so on. An example in particular, and that's where most of my experience with, uh, with this concept, concept comes from, is an app called Sage Life from uh, one of our strategic partners, it's an accounting app for small and medium businesses, and it, f it is fully built using Lightning. So take a look at the video right now in this next slide, and you'll see how such an app can actually be extremely rich. So all of those components that you see there are custom because they contain a whole bo bunch of uh, functionality that we do not provide as standard. And they spent, I would say, the best part of six to nine months actually rebuilding their apps to, to leverage the best that Lightning Experience actually has to offer. And you can build very rich apps with an amazing user experience, but still maintaining customizability using the app builder so that admins at their many customers can actually customize the app and, and, and make the best out of it. And finally, you can even use additional features from Wave, which ultimately can actually be exposed within Lightning Experience itself to provide rich charts and uh, reports and, uh, and dashboards within Lightning Experience as well. So they, that's another technology that they are now embedding. So this was an app completely engineered for Lightning Experience, hundreds of components, quite a few custom components, including components that were built because um, certain base, base Lightning components were still not available from Salesforce. 
Of course, that, has now cha that is now changing. But in this case, Sage needed to accelerate their, their implementation, and therefore, they went down this particular route. Customers love this app compared to the initial version that they actually had in Classic because the UX is obviously so much more better. And feel free to go to this particular URL and, uh, and access a Sage Live demo that you can, you can go through. By the way, all of these slides will be provided to you guys afterwards. No need to take any, any pictures. And uh, I will also be providing links to the, the, to the many resources that I'll be discussing throughout the session. So another example is our Dreamhouse app that anyone can download and install into a developer environment. Again, it will contain a number of Lightning components, integration with uh, things like Heroku. And you can see for, for usage of the utility bar. And again, examples of what a rich user experience is that has been built from the ground up for Lightning. So the first question is, how can you actually design an app like this? And we we're talking about what can potentially be a very significant challenge that would requires a lot of resources, a lot of developers to actually build something like that, which is highly customizable and, and even highly complex to a certain degree. Well, the first thing you need to do is to actually really understand the Lightning feature set. So understand what's available today, but also understand what's potentially going to be available in next few releases so that you can prioritize your workload, focusing on what you can do today while you, you potentially wait for Salesforce to deliver a certain feature so that you can accelerate when, uh, rather than you know, spending too much time in something that will eventually be, be replaced at a later point. So there are two aspects that really need to be fully understood. The first one is, is around what can be done in Lightning from a declarative standpoint. So you need to understand the various capabilities that Lightning apps have. For instance, the capability to add uh, the Lightning utility bar, to add branding, all of that stuff. That can be done completely in a declarative way. You need to understand the capabilities of the Lightning pages. Understand the very interesting features that the Lightning utility bar can provide, a component or, or one or more components that can be available at any point when you're interacting with a particular app understanding where you can use Lightning Actions. And of course, everything else around tabs. It's also important to think about whether your components will need some sort of metadata layer. And by this, I mean a few things. I can potentially mean thing, things like uh, having custom objects that store configuration data so that your Lightning components actually read that configuration data and then dynamically react to whatever configuration you're injecting into those components or using something like custom metadata types that can also be used for Lightning components, even though they have a slightly, uh, slightly narrower scope. Finally, you will always need things like data model and security that we already provide for any app, regardless of whether it's classic or Lightning experience. On the programmatic side, you, you need to understand our event framework and how you can leverage it, and uh, also to understand what base Lightning components are actually avail available today. Base Lightning components are the building blocks for any more advanced components that you will ultimately build, and they will save you a significant amount of time. They will allow you to actually, um, for instance, leverage uh, parts of uh, our Lightning design system and implement them directly into your Lightning component without having to do any, any sort of rework. You can just inject them there, apply some attributes, and Lightning will, will ultimately take care of uh, in injecting that particular design system component into, into your uh, other component. You will obviously need a, a number of uh, custom lightning components that will ultimately be uh, available in the app builder and so on so that your, your users and your admins can actually configure their pages using those components. Obviously, I mentioned the lightning design system, which is actually a very important point because um, I've seen some partners thinking about uh, using different UX frameworks or different uh, design systems in their apps. But the reality is that we've put so much thought into uh, the Lightning design system that I really recommend that if you're building an, an app, and uh, you can follow the example that of Sage over there, um, really think about using Lightning design system. It will make your life so much easier. It will support all sorts of questions that when you actually get into the details, you will actually be glad that you've, you've managed to avoid all of that simply by using something that, is, a, that uh, is already there and for which we've already answered a lot of answers, a, a, a lot of questions, right? 
Um, Lightning Data Service, which will save you from actually having to write Apex in some instances. And Lightning Container Component, which will allow you to use um, other JavaScript frameworks if you already created some components using, say, Angular and so on, that you now need to expose into your new app. All of this will require a combination of JavaScript, potentially still visual force for some scenarios. And of course, our, uh, our platform technologies such, such as Apex, qu querying our APIs, and of course, even platform events that you should really look, look into to actually empower your app. You can have a Lightning component listening to events from Salesforce, from outside of Salesforce, and react immediately once those events actually take place. Uh, let me just go over quickly around uh, our roadmap for base lighting components. So, so this is where we are today. We continue investing on, um, on making the creation of, say, forms easier using lighting components, or firing off models and notifications. And ultimately, our goal is by winter 18 to reach parity with the lighting design system. So every single component from the lighting design system will end up being available as a base lighting component that you can actually use to implement your, uh, your custom components. And we'll continue that effort. I think 86 is kind of the golden number that we believe developers will in generally need to, um, to actually build apps using, using Lightning. So we're, we're going to hit that number very, very quickly. And I recommend that you stay tuned to our roadmap for, uh, for base Lightning components, because that will ultimately save you a lot of time. Also, I mentioned Lightning container components that will allow you to actually use uh, frameworks like, like Angular. And uh, again, this is all about saving time. If you've already built uh, a significant piece of work using, using, Lightning, using, say, Angular, you can now expose it within Lightning. And you can still ensure that those components will interact with Lightning components using our event framework. So we've covered the Lightning feature set. And the next bit is about how to actually architect an app, or actually come up with a component architecture that will best serve you. And I have a few principles that I think should be kept in mind when we are doing that. The first one is around performance. I think, to me, performance should really be top of mind, because ultimately, users will actually value it. Obviously, when you're building Lightning Components, the first thing you, you have on, on your mind is how to deliver an amazing user experience. And you're going to build your components thinking about how that experience can actually be implementing, implementing using those various components. But ultimately, your users will also care about performance quite a lot. So always find opportunities to optimize performance along the way. And in addition to that, I would recommend thinking about making sure that your components are configurable either using attributes using the App Builder or having some sort of metadata layer, like custom objects or custom metadata types that allow admins to really use those components in any sort of scenario and ultimately making them highly reusable. So you can have a, a, a component that, is, can, that will be able to be used in a variety of scenarios. You can have a component that generates a related list. You can have a comp that same component showing some sort of card list view and so on and so on depending on which scenario you actually need. And ultimately, also making sure that those components are, are maintainable. But this will ultimately make life easier, more for developers rather than users or admins. I think uh, users should be top of mind. So therefore, your focus should be performance. If you need to sacrifice any one of these, try avoiding sacrificing performance. So let me move on. So configurability, and so on, and so on to the next slide. All right, so based on my experience, I kind of split uh, components into, into a number of different categories, starting with uh, service components. So service components could, could be used by any other components that, uh, that you eventually create. Service components can contain, for instance, all the logic that the Lightning component needs to communicate with the server. So they will have as properties extensible equals true, meaning that other components would extend them and therefore be able to reuse all of that logic to communicate with, uh, with Apex. So you only build that logic once, and you're able to, for each component that, that actually uses it, inform uh, the, how that logic should actually take place. And I'll go into that in, into a bit more detail. Helper components are optional. They will be used for certain components that can for instance, require 
some sort of custom cache to be implemented or need to do some additional features that uh, are not easy to implement, um, you know, having a single component or having logic in a, in a single component. Building block components is w are basically the category where you're going to be spending a lot of your time. So these will typically align with our base lighting components. So those, those, those building blocks that ultimately make up a larger component. Some of these will be standard, some of these will be custom. Some of these can simply be derivations directly from the lighting design system that you need to have there for uh, the purpose of having more flexibility. And that's where you're going to be spending the majority of your time and the majority of your code. And finally, the end goal of all of this is to have the experience components. So those components available in the app builder that admins can configure using attributes or using metadata. So uh, if they're really simple, they can be powered by the Lighting Data Service. If they're not, they can even be fully dynamic and potentially metadata driven to provide the best experience possible to admins. Let me go over an example of a, a service component. A service component could potentially uh, be serving something like a, a utility bar component. So a component that shows up in the utility bar and provides some sort of navigation menu. And therefore, the, that utility bar component would extend the service component and would be able to reach out uh, to Apex and query any, of the, any objects that actually contain the configuration data for that particular menu. Or we can have something a bit more complex, like a card list view, that needs to be generic enough to support a number of different objects. And therefore, that controller will, will ultimately need to use uh, dynamic Apex and Sockel to be able to interact with things like accounts, opportunities, or custom objects. All of these using the exact same service component, but in different ways. So it, this means that it's actually important to ensure that that service component can actually adapt to whatever scenarios it may be needed in terms of reaching out to Apex. And ultimately, ex experience components are all of these. So examples would include, um, say, Carly's views, drag and dropping for uh, selecting particular prices for uh, things like the Dreamhouse app, or those, um, those, 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 those lists that you can see there in terms of properties, that component over there around opportunity teams. All of these are ultimately experience components that admins could use to further configure their app. And then when we move on to, um, no, to building a whole application using our custom components, using a combination of our base, base lighting components and all of that, we will start to think about our key principles again. So going back to performance, let me focus a bit more on how you can actually design for, for performance and having performance front of mind when you're building these components. So the first thing is to understand that uh, whenever you're making a call to the server, you're, you will need be necessarily impacting the performance of your lighting component because that actually takes a, a, com a comparatively long time versus having data available at the, on the client side. So whenever possible, avoid loading data from the server. And, and there are a few means of doing that. So uh, you can, first of all, uh, pass data from parent to child using attributes. So using the parent component to actually manage data and then sending attributes to the various child components to provide whatever data is needed. Using Lightning Data Service, which will have its built-in caching and it will, it will optimize any calls to the server. Using storable actions, and I'll go to, into storable actions into a, more, a bit more detail in a bit. And finally, actions with, which are simply calls to the server to retrieve data. So in terms of priority, you should be using Lightning Data Service when possible, storable actions, and finally, actions. Whenever possible, lazy load data. So only get data when the user actually requires it, rather than trying to load everything at the same time. And if necessary, even go all the way and implement some sort of local data store, especially if you're using a lot of metadata so that that metadata is always available when the user <laughs> is navigating throughout the page. Uh, storable actions. So going back to this, whenever you're making a call to the server, you have an option to actually set that action as storable. That means that uh, the first call to the server will, return, will actually store that data into a kind of a local cache on the client side. If a component requests that data again, the cache will be served to that component first while the call to the server actually takes place. So the user will actually not notice that, that particular behavior and therefore they will have ultimately a better experience. Uh, 
And then ultimately, you also need to think about when you should actually be loading your components. Whenever possible, again, try deferring the component creation. So only the essential components should be created first. And then you can use some logic, including things like ROIF, to delay components from being created if they are inside the larger component. You can also look at things like, um, like toggling visibility. You also have uh, the dynamic lighting pages that can potentially help with this particular scenario. Again, focusing on ensuring that only the relevant components are loaded at a particular point in time. And fi finally, another interesting behavior that not everyone is aware of around so-called queries. So if you make a call to the server, say, when you're initializing a page, you'll see that uh, we are actually not counting that against Apex uh, uh, governor limits for Sokol. However, if you do uh, a, call to, a call to server after you know, the, the initial loading of the page takes place, you'll see that we are actually counting them. And therefore, it's important that you understand how you can work around those limits and what are the options that you have. And those options, are, well, there are quite a few of them, are to, again, think about using Lightning Data Service when it's available, using some sort of cache, using custom metadata types if, you're, uh, if, if your problem is around trying to load some sort of configuration for that particular component, or using set background when you're making that call to the server. And we'll go over, over this in the demo in a second. You can also try something else, which is chaining component loading by groups. So whenever a component finishes loading, it tells another group of components to load, and so on and so on. And I'll show you a few examples of this. So let me move on to the, to the demo quickly. And I have uh, my org here. And I have a, a kind of a page. Actually, let me just I see this is not showing for some reason. Just move on. OK, there we go. All right. So let me just close this here. All right, so I have my, my org here. and. You'll see a few, few things. Let me just uh, reduce the size of the screen here. Sorry. Because otherwise, you're unable to see this correctly. All right. So uh, let me just see. I think I'm having some issues here with, uh, with showing my full screen. Can you? Sorry. Give me, give me just one second. I'm trying to show my full screen here, but. Yeah, so that screen there. Yeah, because it's not showing the the bottom of the, the screen. Mm, no, it's n well, it's not quite working. Oh. Let me see what, what I can do. Uh, OK, so the only issue I have here is that uh, I have a utility bar component. And the utility bar is not showing for some reason. So let me do something else. I'll improvise, which is fine. So let me just change, change a few things here. So I have a component that would typically be shown using the, the lighting utility bar, in this particular case, as a um, Oh, or actually, I'll, I'll do something else, which is to actually do some configuration here. One second. Let me just make it. It's probably easier if I actually make it visible. Right, so let me go into the utility bar and add the component there. All right, and then if I refresh this, it should hopefully work. All right, OK, so so I have my recruitment page with a, with a custom component that I created because it needed to, to have all of those buttons there around uh, you know, creating new candidates, emailing a CV, and so on and so on, and creating positions, printing job specs, and so on. And what I have is a, a kind of a nav assistant component that will provide some help guidance when I'm interacting with, the, with these components. 
And I do that by clicking on this question mark button here for each one of these components. And what I want you to, to check is the behavior of the assistant here when I'm clicking on a particular, particular component. So when I click on the first one there, you'll see, note specifically how quickly the text actually loads for this component. So I click it there, and it takes a, you know, a fraction of a second, a second to load. I do the same for this particular component. I get a different message, and it loads. If I do this again for the first one, given that I'm using set storable for this particular component, I get a cache hit, and therefore, it changes actually immediately. So this is how you can potentially improve the, the performance of your app to, to have an experience that your users will actually enjoy, even though on the background, we're actually getting a refreshed copy of that data in case that data has changed. In this particular case, this is all pretty much static or, or data that will not change very often. So this is how, what you can do using something like, um, like set storable. So let me just quickly show you here um, that particular component. You'll see that I have, a, I have an action that I'm creating, and I have this action set storable before I fire it off to the, to the server. If I go back to my, to my window, You'll see. We, we can we can move on to the to the other example. So, another example that I wanted to to show you is is more around the management of SQL limits. So I have this first screen here, and what what's happening here is that I created uh, a component that simply executes a certain number of queries on the on the background using Apex, and it actually displays the governor limits against that particular um, against that, that particular limit. So you'll see that I have actually divided these components into groups. So I have five components for group one. And for every single one of them in group one, you'll see that for every 20 queries, my limit, which is the, the one on the second row here, is always 20, meaning that every individual component has its own transaction space for the purpose of actually counting governor limits. But look at what's happening with group two. You'll see that for some of them, we're actually accumulating the number of transactions. So group two, by that point, especially for that, co that component right there on the, on the right-hand side, it has already reached the governor limit of 100 SQL queries per transaction. So if in some instances you're actually loading components after the page actually gets initialized, you may need to think about how you handle this. And one idea is to use the set background option. In, the, in, those com in those components when you're making that call. So in this bit here, uh, you'll see that, again, we have uh, multiple different groups of, uh, of components, et cetera, but the governor limit will never get reached because as we're using set background, we are effectively forcing every single one of those actions to be loaded in a, in a separate transaction. So I'll show you very quickly the, um, the developer console again. And I'll just quickly show you how you can compare the, the options. So this is the first uh, component for the first SQL, uh, SQL page. It simply calls out to server without any additional option. And this one here, we're defining a set background. Therefore, we're forcing this to go into separate transaction. And therefore, we'll be safe in terms of governor limits. So this is something that you'll need to potentially do if you have a lot of components being loaded in the page after it gets initialized. Let me go back to the presentation. Oh, no, sorry, not this. There we go. And just wrap up with a few takeaways. All right. So. So my, my, key, my core message is basically this one. I think we have an amazing thing with, with Lightning Experience that ultimately allows you guys to build apps for your users, be it whether you're customers, whether you are, you are app exchange partners, to build amazing apps for your customers that can be highly customizable, very rich, and provide a level of user experience that they never really had with Classic. In order to do that, please make sure that you really understand the Lightning feature set,
really understand how we, you can leverage it and understand our roadmap and how you can potentially align with Salesforce when we are delivering um, that roadmap, making, say, more base lighting coupons available and so on. Understand our performance best practices. And we, have, we are investing on making more of these available. I've, I've touched on a few points here, but of course there are many more. And ultimately focus on having some core architectural principles that you can follow when you're building your app. So focusing on performance, configurability, reusability and maintainability, thinking always that the user should really come first and therefore focusing on providing an, an excellent user, ex user experience by ensuring your components have high performance but that they are also highly customizable for to, to serve a number of different scenarios. We have a number of resources that you, you probably saw in a, in a previous session. We have Trailhead modules, the Lightning Components Developer Guide, and we also have some code in GitHub that we can share with you guys that we've been working on. Again, we'll be providing this presentation after, after this session, so you, can, you guys can actually take a look. Uh, I have some time for Q&A, I think, while, while the other presentation gets set up. So I, I'll be happy to take on any questions now. I've tested it, and I believe it's only the, the, a single component. Yeah. So the Lightning Container Component runs within effectively an iframe, right? So it does not have access to the DOM. So you need to use events to, to communicate with... Uh, with yeah. But but do you need to use the lightning co container components in that sense? Oh, sorry, All right. All right. Yeah, you should be able to use that directly into lightning component, right? Yeah. Well, what I would recommend there is to test using Locker Service because the Locker Service will protect you from any any issues or any kind of vulnerability. If you ensure that your Lightning component is version 40 or above, it will be running using like Locker Service. So, 40 and above, yeah. So uh, there's there's an API, API option to change the API of a Lightning component, making sure it's 40 and above, it will be running using Locker Service. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry? Yes, everything is asynchronous in terms of actions. That, that, that's one of the advantages, right? You always use it? The performance will, will be different. It will be slightly slower for to start off versus not using it. Yeah. If effectively, I mean, the, the, it's always asynchronous, right? But set background is basically means it has lower priority than the other calls. So if you have a, a lot of other calls taking place, they will be prioritized versus the ones that have set background. So that, that's one, one of the things. Any, any other questions? You're talking about the, the the order of loading the the components. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how we would determine that, but I, I, I guess there there will be some sort of order when you're when you're making uh, making those calls that will ultimately follow. But I don't think you can potentially you know chain them or have a particular sequ sequence that you can follow. You can do that in a in a number of ways, kind of manually or programmatically. But uh, but not directly, simply by pushing it to to set background. Mark, how are you? Any other questions? All right. So thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the session. And again, all of this will be shared. And do enjoy Trail Thank you for coming.